Okay, I've started the recording. This is the June 5th, 2018 Rook Community Meeting. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, let's take a look starting with the 0 0.8 milestone. So I think we've uh, had some conversations recently about, you know, what is essential for the milestone to be completed. And I think we made some good progress recently on some of those issues. Um, I think it's probably about time now to clear off the like to haves on the project board that we're looking at now, because we need to you know, converge and get the 0 0.8 release out sooner rather than later. So I want to start making you know more tangible progress towards actually finishing this milestone. So I'm going to remove some of the like to haves off this board and just stick with what the core uh, 0 0.8 features and issues that we've already discussed are. Um, <clears throat> some of the long poles here for the 0 0.8 milestone, I think are the, I think probably the longest one is still the uh, getting OSDs to run in a, uh, you know, each have their own pod. Uh, do you uh, Red Hat guys want to give an update on the status of that? Plum you're here, right? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, so we get most of the bits ready. Um, there's a few things I think we have to take a further look. One is that the, the upgrade path. Um, there's two issues here. One is that uh, because of the multi, uh, multi backends API change, that makes it uh, hard to upgrade. For, um, in my opinion, make it, um, the upgrade is not relatively trivial. The second is that uh, OSD right now use the device map, uh, device, not that device config map. Um, so if you have a, a 0.7 uh, code in the system and you want to upgrade from 0.7 to 0.8, uh, the API change is one, one of those things. And then the device, how do you map the devices from the OSDs, existing OSDs to the ones that you are using the device config map. Uh, that's be a significant challenge. Uh, the third thing is the, uh, the OSD and the mount are using deployments um, versus replica sets uh, in point seven. So all these things connected um, makes me believe that we probably will have a breaking changes in point eight. Um, so how we're going to deal with upgrade, or should we support upgrade at all? So, yeah, I wonder if we can find a way to um, either support the you know, or not seven running in some different mode, like those that were using daemon sets. Maybe they could continue using a, a daemon set in some way. But I know there's been a lot of change here, so it's going to be a, a challenge to support one way or another. Um, I unfortunately haven't had a chance to really think about that upgrade path yet. So uh, just to be clear here, uh, does it, are you guys saying, or it sounds like what you're saying is that there are some upgrade obstacles that are beyond the scope of just what you need to be concerned with uh, specifically about the OSDs running in their own pods. There's other things beyond that scope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with, uh, with the upgrade, so in the work that was done to support multiple storage providers and types, um, you know, we updated the upgrade guide and, you know, going through that results in a functional, uh, you know, Rook or Ceph cluster after that's all done and the migration to the new types is done. Um, so are there things currently in master that are not, correctly supported for upgrade that you guys have found? I'm just trying to figure out where the gaps are here. Um, there's certain things. Uh, one, that's um, the, if you are still continuing to use the um, uh, 0.7 API, uh, v1, v1 alpha one, um, and you want to upgrade from there, uh, it's going to be some challenge. Um, the second thing is um, uh, the the switch to do from a replica sets to demo sets. I haven't figured out how that upgrade will work. 
and the and then how we figure out the devices being used by the existing OSDs and convert the devices into config maps. That's going to be uh, the third thing in my mind that's need to be. So let's let's talk about the first one real quick, Wyman. Uh, the you know the about types you know the rook dot io v one alpha one. Uh, so we have you know automatic conversion code migration code by the operator mm -hmm. that uh, you know converts all those types and updates them to new ones. So is there there's you're saying that there's still an issue outstanding yeah. with that that wasn't so addressed? I haven't tried that yet because uh, my setup is currently broken, but. So you said if I just uh, run from uh, points eight with the master code and then I use the um, the V one alpha one, I could able I should be able to create the new API. Yes, yeah, exactly. So it, like uh, if you were so if for a user scenario here, that's uh, has a zero dot seven cluster deployed, uh, the steps in the upgrade guide to you know. Uh, to delete the operator and let it recreate itself, that when the operator comes up, it will automatically uh, convert all the V1 alpha one types to you know V1 alpha two or the ceph.rook.io types, you know, recreating the CRDs and doing all that migration automatically. Uh, and I've tested that so multiple that's, times so myself. That's for, the, yeah, that's for the existing API or just the APIs I'm going to be created. Uh, it's just so, for about seven APIs, right? So whatever yeah, we're creating sure now is, it wouldn't need to be converted. Is this a question of whether or not there are any class of user who couldn't be supported or just that the automatic conversion is not clear? So I think the former, uh, Caitlin, and, I'm, and that's what I'm trying to get at as well, to try to understand if there are any, any scenarios out there that wouldn't be able to be supported in any way. Okay. Because um, when I rebased the, uh, to the, uh, the master code, uh, I'm using the, the, YAML, the YAML I was using was not quite working. So I just updated my YAML with the, the Ceph API instead of the, the V1 Alpha 1 API, and then that started working. So my impression was uh, uh, the master code. Um, if I just use the the V1 Alpha One API, it doesn't. I should try that again to confirm. So if that's the case, if the API is not the big issue, so we can move on to the next one. Uh, the config map, the device config map. That's in my opinion going to be some challenge. Um, figuring out what the device is used by the existing OSDs. Um, just a question actually, should we migrate the existing part or just should we just let them run as they are right now and then if we create new clusters, we use the new schemes. So what should be supported of ways for the upgrade? Yeah, that's should a good question, Wyman. And uh, I'm thinking, <coughs> I, I think that um, I may be, able to, may be able to be of help here for you there, because uh, I've done a lot of thinking about upgrade and migration recently while going through that big refactor to support new multi, uh, storage providers. So I think that, you know, I, I wanted to test what you have right now also. So uh -huh. perhaps we can take some of this conversation to the uh, dev channel in Slack. Okay and kind of, you know, converge on getting all these scenarios figured out. Uh, and I want to get my hands a little dirty here too with, uh, with what you have and, you know, making sure it works in my, in the scenarios that I have, uh, you know, uh, locally and vetting that and stuff. And, and I still need to do a, a review of in the sure. PR as well. So I think that, you know, let's start collaborating a little bit and try to converge on some of these upgrade issues and discuss them. So you're not, you're not alone in, in trying to address these. I think we can, you know, as a, a team kind of pitch in some more hands on, on converging on this. Yeah, that sounds great. So we need to look at a, a holistic. One, one thought, Norman, is that um, I think I think it actually would be okay to say that um, OSDs that all run in a single pod remain that way. Um, okay. I, I, I don't see why that's a problem. Um, I think yeah. over time, you know, it converges, but it doesn't mean that, I mean, as long as as long as people upgrade to 0 0.8 and things continue to work, it's mm -hmm. fine. You can think of it as like a, a different disk format, right? I mean, it's, it's as, as an analogy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and if it's complicated to migrate one pod with many OSDs to many pods with one OSD, 
each, then uh, then we just run them side by side. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and the the same, Basam, the same could be said about um, you know what Wyman was talking about with uh, Mon, like the Mons changing from replica sets to deployments. Uh, and the same could be mm-hmm. said for that too. If they're you know stay, if the, the the real goal here is maintaining a functional cluster that you know can serve data requests. Um, so you know if it it, it doesn't necessarily the important part isn't necessarily that everything is running on the latest uh, you know format of the components to to keep the cluster running but as long as it's a functional cluster that's what really i am concerned about but that does have the severe caveat that uh you know i do not want to necessarily get uh it have a bunch of code paths in the code base where we're having to deal with all these legacy um you know types and and um and components uh, and carry that burden for you know forever so that's something to be careful about as well that you know we don't want to get a whole bunch of uh, tangled up code there of having to deal with different um, you know snapshots in time of what was in master so right. we'll have to I, something. I th- yeah I think in this case we'd have to correct little code from that PR that was removed or changed because it, uh, the new way doesn't need the, to run multiple OSD so we'd have to put some of that back and then maintain it and, I think, and how long do we have to maintain that between upgrades do we have to worry about it uh, well I mean if, if it's if it requires like messing with how partition tables and everything else laid out, then I'd say, you know, in the, it, in the, probably a few releases in the memo, right? Mm-hmm. Right. And that's, that's why it, it looks like a disk format change at some level. But was there actually a change to partition layout and stuff like that? I thought it was just well, the discovery agent that this covers. Available and then starts a pot. And the partitions are already existing, so did, the, did something change that? Sorry, say that again, Alexander. I'm not sure I caught that. The disks are, or the directories are already prepared. Mm-hmm. So I, I haven't seen any change to the partition layout that is needed for. Uh, for the OSDs. The only thing that we right now have is an issue that the partitions are not created anymore, the DB and VAL partitions. Uh, but still, uh, as far as I understand, uh, at least allowing the uh, person to, in some way, tell the, op- tell the operator to um, start a new deployment for the OSD or the job to prepare the OSDs, or more or less, see, uh, the prepare job then sees. Uh, that the OSDs are already existent and then just adds them to the nodes. This could also be done manually because, well, we don't have automatic upgrades yet, so it's totally okay if the user has to manually uh, do some stuff. Mm-hmm. I think we should only go for keeping old code in a code base unless there is no other, um, no other way to do it. Yeah, so it sounds like there's lots to investigate here, so maybe we should take the Upgrade off offline. Yeah. Right. Oh, well, still online, please. You know, it's a bit hard for me to hear. Well, you okay. <laughs> Out of this meeting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've always hated that term uh, offline <laughs> when you really mean still digitally. And right. but yeah. Anyways, uh, I've I've gotten accustomed to that over my career. Um, cool. So then, yeah. So uh, the dev channel, Wyman, would be a great place to continue discussions on that. All right. And yeah, thanks for all your work on this so far too. It's not a not an easy feature, so the, your your uh, efforts have been appreciated. Mm-hmm. Sorry, just just on that one, I, I know there was. I, I'm still very curious about the if there if it's going to cause a problem with OSD chatter. Um, I, I can't remember if we resolved that or not. Did we find out what changed in Ceph that fixes that? Yeah, I, I don't remember hearing a, a resolution or or what, yeah, or why it would have been resolved. Uh-huh. I, 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 my hunch says these things just don't go away on their own. So uh, uh, it'll be awesome to see uh, what actually changed to solve the, you know, OSDs in separate namespaces 
don't start heart beating and trying to find themselves on the same host. Right. Uh, Travis, is this okay, something yeah. where you can look into or? Yeah, well, uh, we'll definitely need it on the list of things to resolve before we merge. Um, the so. alternative is if we convince that it's fixed, then maybe maybe we should do some long haul testing on it. I'm 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 worried that we're you know when we saw this in the past, things come up and look okay, but day day two they're not. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Long haul. It'd be great to get that going again. I don't know of any long haul that's happened for a while besides people actually just running it in their clusters. Well, zero seven one is running fine. <laughs> yeah, just as far as running around our own test infrastructure. Right. Um, kind of uh, a topic looking into test infrastructure. There, um, is everyone right now aware that our that the Jenkins is right now in that regard broken? That the GSC tests are. Not yeah, and, uh, Alex, we have a uh, uh, an agenda item for that coming up, so we'll get into that discussion in just a okay. second. Yeah, that's oh, definitely uh, definitely an issue we want to talk about. Uh, but so let's try to wrap up uh, the zero point eight discussion. Though, are there uh, other outstanding tickets on this board here, or included in the zero point eight milestone, that uh, are of at risk or ones that we are concerned about? Um, the, the security model changes that, that are in review. Uh, just need to close on that. And um, yeah, Basam, when you get a chance to, to review that PR, I think uh, well, it feels like it's in a much better place now. But I know there's still some questions around uh, if it's, if it's yeah, I'll, more changes. I'll, I'll, take, I'll or... take a look this week. Mm -hmm. OK. I don't feel like it's a huge risk, but it may involve some iteration. So okay. I don't want to delay 0.8 for it. But... Okay. That, that's the only risk. Cool. And Alex, are there uh, of your tickets here that you have in review? Are there ones that are these any that you're concerned about? Um, you know, not having a solution for or delaying zero point eight. Well, the only issue I'm not one hundred percent sure if. Uh, well, the issue is fixed. Uh, is the node cannot be removed from the cluster when its usage uh, usage is uh, zero. Um. But as far as I understood your comment on the origin on an issue, um, what I did kind of fixed it, and you have some feedback on it. But it can't be tested right now because of the, yeah, well, partly because of the CI issue. Right. Okay. But we're, we don't have any of these that you know are architectural risks or anything big that you know is. Uh, okay. The other thing that's a bit bigger uh, still is the months uh, should never be placed on a node with another month. Um, that one got kind of bigger now, uh, especially because, well, in the first part, I did what the ticket said, but in the second part, I kind of fixed a few tests for it and, well, cleaned up some stuff there. So it's a bit bigger. But I think uh, Travis. Yeah, I, I signed off on it now. We just need the build to be green again. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. So I think those first two that Alex has there are ready for merge after the build's good. There are also some other ones, uh, one or two documentation stuff. Uh, but with that, also, we need to wait for the CI, uh, as Travis said, because the master is failing too. Cool. Yeah, no, all those sound like, uh, you know, much shorter polls than some of the other things we've yeah, talked it's, about earlier. It's nothing dramatic. Yeah. OK, mm -hmm. cool. And Tony, are there any concerns from your side about the, the 0 0.8 milestone for you? Uh, not really. I think the stuff I'm more concerned with is the, the object storage stuff. It's a little more forward looking. Yeah. Okay, cool. That sounds good, Tony. Okay, so let's um, move on to the next uh, agenda item today. And Alex, that is exactly what I believe you wanted to talk about. So in general, you know, we've had some reliability uh, concerns with our Jenkins continuous integration uh, infrastructure. Some of those have been uh, sort of addressed or made somewhat more reliable, uh, but there is the 
biggest new and and blocking issue that we have right now is that the GCE instances we have to run tests, end-to-end uh, -end integration tests, uh, are not are they're offline, and we have not been able to figure out why they will not come up and be able to run tests. So we're in a scenario now where when a pull request is updated or opened and the end-to-end -end integration test suite needs to run, the Jenkins uh, master waits uh, for the GCE node to come up uh, and times out after like, I don't know, an hour or something. So we get a whole bunch of builds stacked up and waiting uh, for you know hours at a time. So we need to figure out why the um, GCE nodes cannot come up online and start running tests. And um, Ilya was looking at this yesterday and I was helping him, but I don't know if we, what exactly the issue is or what, you know, an estimation for a resolution is. So there's not, um, I think this is a high priority and we're going to continue working on this, but I don't necessarily have a, uh, a resolution. Can we, right can we work around this by not testing on GCE for now? We talked about that yesterday, and uh, initially, I believe that Travis, you, uh, we, we didn't want to do that uh, to because that's um, it has right. it's it's the has only a, one in the matrix we have, right? Right. We only have one of the Kubernetes versions on GCE, and I guess the worry is if we turn it off, then you know, what will be the motivation to get it working again, or it might take too long. Oh, no, yeah. just, uh, As we just, become more blocked though, I'm, I'm starting to uh, agree with you, Basam. Right. If, if we're more well, blocked test, more than a day or the, two, you know. Test on Amazon for now. Right. Test so, the, all the different versions on Amazon. Right. That's making more sense to do today than it, than it did yesterday when we first started looking at this. Right. Sure. Oh, and that, that's understandable. If it's yeah, more than today, then we need to be unblocked. So, uh, kind of one point from my side there with the blocking here. The thing is that we can't even merge a doc change as right now, um, which is, well, yeah, pretty bad. Mm -hmm. As we already uh, see. I guess, well, the master build is already in a, a red state, so <laughs> we, could, we could merge the doc changes, but they won't be published to rook.io either, because since Why the build fails. Uh, Publish step won't ex execute. Yeah, so uh, Ilya, uh, I'll try to find some time with Ilya this morning to continue looking into this. Uh, but I Don't believe that we're that? getting to a state now where disabling GC just to unblock ourselves and move forward uh, does make sense. Uh, Jared? Right. Yes, Alex? Yeah. If you have me in the meeting slash talks with Ilya, I'll probably join in and uh, looking at the Jenkins and Figuring out further plans for it. Oh, sure. Yeah, the, we'll have that conversation on the uh, test channel. Okay, sure. Yeah, awesome. Bye. Thanks, Alex. Okay, uh, any, anything else that anybody wants to bring up about Jenkins or CI right now? Uh, we still have the couple of open issues there, but I don't know that we need to discuss them here, like the unconfigured link and, the, and tests that run back-to-back -back fail pretty consistently. I didn't have this issue till yesterday until uh, when I ch changed the uh, one URL in the chicken settings. So if we are lucky, it's solved. Maybe Clearly it's you broke GCE, good. Alex. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be interesting yeah. to see if that override uh, URL does solve that problem. Um, so we'll keep an eye out for that. Keep an eye out, yeah. Uh, hopefully. Let's hope it's gone. It's... That'd be great if it is. Thanks, yeah. Alex. Okay, uh, I think we, we had a discussion about um, upgrade and migration in the context of, um, you know, the OSD pod changes. Um, and then uh, just a little bit more on that. Travis, you updated the pull request template to have a checklist item about making sure that each pull request has thought through upgrade and migration impact, correct? Yes, yeah, that's in. Okay, cool. So I like that in general, as a community, we are being more focused and mindful of upgrade um, impacts to our user base um, because with each release and with each, um, you know, with the growth of our community and more users on the current code base, um, you know, we have a fair, fair amount of people 
kind of depending on their clusters continuing to run across releases. So as a community, I think that, you know, we've done, we've started to be very mindful of this. And so I like that progress that we've made. And I think it's important as well when, when reasonable. Is there a way to just include upgrades as part of a continuous integration? Like just, just test an upgrade to whatever the latest commit is. Um, not probably not yet, Tony, because uh, the upgrade, um, the the support we have for upgrades does have manual steps. There's not full automated upgrade um, that's been done in you know in the operators. So having an integration test about it, um, you know, would, would have to also incorporate some of those manual steps. So it it might be very kind of difficult at this point so far. All right. But I like that idea though, absolutely. Yeah, once we have op upgrade automation, clearly we'll need that. Yeah, we definitely should have an end-to-end -end test then to make sure that we don't regress upgrade functionality. Um, I think with that, uh, we should look into where do we paralyze, uh, parallel, parallel lights? I don't know. <laughs> um, you got it. <laughs> because uh, I think we are right now with integration tests and everything like at 40, 45, 50 minutes depending on how long the build may need to wait. And that's, well, it's fine, but you know. It's, it's long, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and yes, that's a good point, Alex, and uh, that it will also be impacted by adding more storage providers as well. You know, like some Neo integration tests or Cockroach DB integration tests that will only serve to uh, you know, further increase that build time. So parallelizing some of those efforts where we, they can be, um, you know, mm -hmm done that way is, is definitely a smart idea. All right, uh, so Tony had brought up a couple of issues uh, about object storage, um, you know, user CRDs and some abstractions. Uh, Tony, do you want to talk about these now? Uh, yeah, sure. There were two things I want to talk about. The, the, there was a ticket about uh, a user CRD that somebody had expressed interest in. I think Travis chimed in on that. Um, I, I don't know, like what what the story is as, as far as like like usability of that. So I think one guy mentioned that he would like it, but um, but we don't really have enough of like a use case. I think like there's not a, a, a user workflow that makes sense to start a design from. So I wanted to see if if anybody knew something I didn't there. Like have people come up and said they wanted this user CRD and like how they would use it and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. or design. Yeah, there's definitely been interest. I think a few people, you know, liked that ticket or whatever, but the, I think the right now, the documentation we have as far as creating an, an object store and consuming it, uh, we mentioned here, go to the toolbox and run, run this Ceph command to go create a user. And then it's, so the, you know, just from a basic walkthrough perspective, we know we need a user and creating a, you know, creating a user with a CRD would make that flow a lot better. I think it's not clear what the design looks like for the CRD. Like, you know, if it generates a secret, um, how do you, how do you know that, how do you get that secret back from the user we just created? And, how to consume it anyway. So I think there's some design questions, but right now the documentation is pretty manual as far as creating an object store user. Right. So, I mean, they essentially just want to be able to just cube cuddle create user and then just be able to like access things with that user. Right. The, the thing I'm concerned with is the, I mean, let's say you've already made it. How are you dealing with permissions and things like that? Right. So we'd have to tie in that user to, every single type of storage. Uh, once the bucket CRD goes in, like tie users to the buckets, tie users to the file system and Ceph. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that becomes a, just a, I mean, a burden really, right? I, I, I don't know. Um, is, was that the intention or was it just to automate the creation of a user and then they would go in and manually deal with the permissions issues? Yeah, I, I think users, want the easier flow of how to create a user instead of going dropping into the toolbox anytime we drop into the toolbox it feels like oh we're, we just left the nice sandbox of the good way of doing things 
Also, okay. keep in mind this is a multi-vendor issue potentially. That um, the, every vendor will have a slightly different concept of what a user is and what permissions it has and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so you're, we're just digging a hole deeper while we're <laughs> preparing for that. Right. Yeah, and this is for object store users specifically. But then, if you have multiple object stores, Minio and Ceph, RGW, you know what? Um, do they even share the CRD or um, anyway? So uh, yeah, it needs some thought through design. Yeah, because it, 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 that I guess ties into this, this bucket abstraction that I have the doc for. Um, I don't know if I, I sent that out yet. But if this user CRD becomes a thing, then that will have to tie into the bucket just for the sake of permissions. Um, so I, I just didn't know if somebody knew of someone or had an idea, like just what a user workflow should look like, um, or what they think it should be. Um, I don't know, or, or how we can like solicit that uh, information from people. Right. Yeah, I don't think we have a clear idea yet, but the, let's see. So Jared, well, if you scroll up, how many people have you know, clicked on that, so several. So if we look at them, five. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I could ask them at least to, for a start on what uh, you know what the flow expectations are. Broadly, yeah, my my ex. Oh, go ahead. Broadly, my impression of the field is that the OSD, the optic stores, are divided between those that manage their own users and those that are relying on AD or uh, LDAP to do users for them. Um, and it, it just may be that that two models will have to be permanent, that you're using one or the other, but. Right. Yeah, we might be able to get all OS, all object stores that are using AD to agree about how to add a user to AD. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, well, I guess we'll think some more about that then. Because if, if you make the user and they're doing something with AD, right, like the expectation is not to go in and make the user in their, in their AD. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah I, would, I would expect the CRD to stay simple and not deal with the AD scenario. Right. So, but if, if it's too simple, then I mean, it, it, what value is it bringing, right? Because mm -hmm. we're going to have to support that and if there's well if you're just making clear that this is for adding a local user not if you're using uh an authentication server like ad or ldap okay just making that clear could be a big help <laughs> okay yeah and, and the way i've looked at this so far is is in a fairly simple uh context um that tony i i i in general i see value in uh automation of of you know steps that where people have to go and copy paste things if it's just that then i think that's still a win because right now you have to go to the toolbox and you have to run some commands and then copy this text and paste it somewhere else and you know like find the right thing to put it in and all that and simple automation around that that removes those the need for those manual steps is already a user experience benefit fit and win in my book so it could be just that simple really okay well yeah it, I, I guess I'll, I'll think about that after the the um, bucket design kind of solidifies to, um, yeah cool. so yeah there's definitely things to think think through further here and uh, and I, I do appreciate that you're uh, you know thinking about how that ties into some of the greater uh, designs like um, persistent buckets and stuff too so that that's good Tony yeah um, okay, so then anyone else have something to say on that before I jump into the, the bucket stuff? About u users CRD specifically, Tony? Right, right. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I do not. No, it sounds good. Okay. Um, as far as this, these abstractions go, so I'm, I'm working on a doc for um, bucket abstractions that we can use um, that are tied to uh, Ceph and Minio object storage. Um, and there, so right now it's it's super early phase, and it's we're unable to tie the actual bucket to the um, uh, application lifecycle, right? The same way we do with volumes. 
So the, what, what people would have to do is manually create a bucket and then uh, go off and uh, create the thing, right? And then there's this kind of janky naming scheme um, that, that's, so it'll create uh, the credentials and like a binding with a certain naming scheme based on what you named the bucket. And that's how you tie it to your application and propagate the credentials in. Um, but moving forward, that's not really something we should keep doing. Um, so some of the thought around that was uh, going to SIG storage and seeing if we can kind of broaden the uh, abstractions from volume. So it's not just volume now, it could be bucket or something else and actually tie it to a pod lifecycle. Because um, if we do that, then you can actually have like a persistent claim and things like that and dynamically provision it without having to go in and um, do all these steps. Well, the, what that suggests is the abstraction, you might call something like a mountable, that you can mount a bucket, you can mount an NFS volume, you can mount a, a block volume. Right. And at that level, they actually have a fair amount in common. Yeah, it, but they're, they're also mounted a little differently too. So I mean, the options are slightly different. Yes. Uh, just because the mounting an object store bucket would probably be just propagating the credentials in and then letting the application use it, right? Um, but- uh, hmm? So um, from what I understand, this dynamic part um, with user creation sounds a bit like uh, more of what something uh, an application like Vault could do, at least to me. Um, an application like what? Vault. You know Vault from Hashiko? No. Vault? No. It's a secret storage and stuff like that. It's cool. <laughs> um, to the second part there with the users, um, have you thought about kind of having a generic user? Uh, CID, which kind of like uh, uh, role-based access like Airbuck, uses bindings to bind to certain buckets, to certain stores, or even other stuff? Justin, are there? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can look into that because it's right now it, it's, it, it seems really fragile. This is not fragile, but like limiting this design. It, everything has to be done a certain way and we're relying on a naming scheme. Um, but if we were able to, um, I guess, deal with this like bucket mounting in quotes, right? Um, via just like the secrets that are generated and propagating them into the pods, that, that would just be really nice. Um, anyway, yeah, I, I just wanted to see if people, if people had some thoughts around it. I'll send out a doc here soonish um, just to get some feedback. There's two phases in it. One's the not having to modify a pod spec to accommodate for this. And then the other is, you know, if we're able to modify the pod spec, um, what the world would look like. So, um, yeah. And users really complicates this. Uh, so that's why like, I, I didn't know what the priority was with having an object store user and things like that. Cause that would change this design quite a lot. Cause then you have multiple sets of credentials that are being created. And then you gotta do configurations and permissions on the buckets, things like that. So, yeah. and I don't think, oh, go ahead, Caitlin. I don't think there's a way around the split between a the storage cluster itself having the users and external users. Um, those are two different scenarios. Uh, one is basically optimized for employees as users. And the people who are want employees as users want to use an external authentication store. Mm. And abstracting that to be compatible with a self-managed list of users, uh, that's not an easy abstraction. <laughs> no, that's a concern I have too, right? Like, I mean, any serious company is using like this external, an AV system or something like that, right? And we, we really have no way of tying into that um, so anybody that would be using this kind of like user CRD, it, it's not, it wouldn't be, a, um, I think as valuable for the majority of people. Yes. Since, since and by the way, a company that's already has an AD system for their 10,000 employees is not interesting in hearing your opinion about how they should be keeping track of their employees. Right. Yeah. I mean, and that, that's a <laughs> valid point to bring up. 
uh, and I don't really know how we address that, just given what we've discussed so far, right? Um, yeah, they have their way of keeping track of their employees, and if you want to provide storage for them, you comply with it. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. I mean, it, it, the other storage vendors I've worked at, that's been the, the, the way they do it, right? You need to lay in uh, credential state, their AD system is already existing. Um, so I, 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 I not all. There's some people who take the Dropbox type attitude that you just create your user for that service. Right, but I mean, like any any actual large deployment of storage just implies there's a, a bunch of people behind it, right? If you're trying to sell to an enterprise customer, you use their authentication system. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I don't know how we reconcile, you know, what's been brought up so far with with that. I think that's going to be an elephant in the room moving forward. Um, you know, I think uh, you know the next step of sending out um, some some thoughts and the design that you have uh, so far, Tony, uh, to the greater root community is a good next step. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For the for the buckets and stuff. Yeah. I yeah. think so. We we should probably. You know, I'll, I'll I'll try and write down these concerns in the ticket, right, and just just see if anybody's going to chime in on it. It just seems like we have a higher throughput conversation in this meeting than uh, mm -hmm. issues. So. And you already have that doc. You just you just send out a link to it, or yeah, I, I've got the doc. I, yeah, I just been kind of putzing around with it um, the last few days, just because I mm -hmm. yeah, it's slowed down. So I think it's time to rope in some more people. So okay, good. sounds good. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to uh, the list of pull requests here that we wanted to discuss. So Travis, you added a couple, um, and I think I already have them open here. So here's the first one. Yeah, this one, I, I think we already talked about it, just needs review. Okay. The song that we looked at it. The and second this one. This is the second one. Yeah, this is a fairly simple PR just to expose the Ceph dashboard. I uh, just need some final review. Alexander already looked at it, but Jared, if you could take a quick look at it too, it'd be, that'd be great. And I think that's an unconfigured link. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, nothing really to discuss here other than I just, Need review. Take a look at it. Okay, cool. Sounds good then. Uh, I think that that should be on my list still uh, from catching up from last week. Yep. All right. Um, okay, so I think that's everything we had on the agenda. Oh, Were there I other? May have one? Yes. Uh, where is it? It's the separate bug and feature issue templates. Um, Kind of more for the maintainers, probably. It's the 1764. It's the fourth one in the list. Yeah, it's loading now. Um, well, I kind of found out about the feature, and I, I personally don't see a downside between having, uh, when the user creates a new issue, having a selection between is this a bug report, is this a feature request, or something regular, and then getting a different template. Yeah, it looks like a, a nice feature. I was just curious, is it, uh, if other major projects are doing it already, or, I mean, it's not like it's a confusing feature to just enable, so I, I think it looks good. And by the way, I addressed your comments, uh, Travis. <laughs> yeah, oh, I never responded, did I? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I went to bed, so. But you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's just an example. So, um, if you, yeah. Yeah, I think it'd be good to you know, have, have another maintainer sign off too. Yeah. Yeah, just kind of asking you guys, uh, uh, Travis, Basam, uh, Jared. So, what, uh, so what happens uh, if they click this here, the open a regular issue, what what does that link? You can just go to the link, github.com slash galaxy github issue template. I think I even linked it in the issue. Then you can just see by yourself. I think it's easier in the top, like, top comment. Top, yeah. Now you go to issues, a new issue. And then you get the combined template. That's the old template, or yeah. the one we already have. Well, that seems weird to me. I mean, because it, it it's just a it's both of those together, but they're they're just separate and links above it. I don't know. 
it may as well just be blank if you just open a regular issue, right? Since there's Since something didn't. Yeah. Uh, still, but I, I personally don't want to leave it completely empty, even for a, a regular issue, because yeah, you know, some basic information would is always good. I can change the template. So if you have feedback, go for the go for the review. Yeah. Yeah, maybe a, a different template for, you know, why, you know like, what is you your issue? Like? Yeah, I, I haven't looked at this until just now. Okay, so yeah, so we can continue the discussion then on the pull request. Yeah, yeah thank you for your initiative, Alex. Okay. All right, are there any other items that anybody wanted to discuss today? Um, I had uh, a topic that, or, or something I'd like to get people's feedback on. Um, can you hear me? Yes, is this Blaine? Yes, it is. Hey, Blaine. Good to hear from you, Blaine. Thanks. Um, we've uh, I, I've been having the discussion with uh, some of my um, coworkers here at SUSE about um, like what what the limitations of using Minikube might be for development and like if. Uh, if it's going to become necessary in the future to have uh, a full Kubernetes cluster to actually do development when we start working on some of the features like uh, uh, like seeing what happens when nodes fail or making sure that we like test that Rook is stable on an upgrade from one Kubernetes version to another. Uh, and I, I guess I'm also trying to see like, does everyone use Minikube for development? Does every, you know, do people spin up small Kubernetes clusters? Yeah, that's a fantastic question, Blaine. Um, so there, so Sebastian Hahn had done some work uh, to create a script that brings up, uh, I believe a multiple node cluster uh, using, um, I think, I think it uses the BERT on Linux machines. So there's yeah. support for that. Um, I personally have not used it since I have a Mac, um, but I think that that was working at least for Sebastian's uh, workflows. Does anybody else okay. have comments on that? Is that that kubeadm.sh script? No, it's... Um, yeah, under the documentation, it's a, it's a link to a multi-node development environment. Yeah, it's definitely a great question though, because during development, I'd say you know Minikube is the common thing, but to really test that you know integration and upgrade and multi-node, yeah, you need more than Minikube to to mm -hmm. really know that you're stable. You need to right. be able to simulate having more nodes than you have. Yeah. Right. I guess mm -hmm. um, so. One of the things I have found trying to do that on my local machine is that uh, my my disk becomes a bottleneck. Uh, so is, is that in like uh, like perf test type of scenarios, Blaine? Uh, I even was having issues, um, like I was having arbitrary failures of, of Rook just starting up a, a cluster and like getting mons to talk to each other. And mm -hmm. as much as I could determine, it was, uh, it was coming down to like disk throughput issues. It's not just throughput. You have to really have some correctness issues as well when you have fewer machines than what you're simulating because they don't really do things concurrently anymore. Right. And so you can test, but you can't be certain that you uh, that, that it works. You can just find places it doesn't work. That is... Um, that's a good point. Um, in, internally, I've been trying to use uh, like OpenStack to uh, set up small clusters uh, to test on. But then there is sort of the issue of like whether or not uh, we have OpenStack resources. Um, Yeah, I personally, Blaine, haven't used uh, you know OpenStack really at all. Uh, one solution that we, we were Travis and I had used in the past uh, when we were still at Quantum was uh, using the CoreOS Vagrant repo. 
to bring up a you know multiple virtual machines uh, that are running CoreOS instances, and then using kubeadm to deploy uh, you know multi-node Kubernetes cluster across those. Uh, that had some pretty good success for us in terms of being able to run you know multiple node clusters that have multiple disks. Um, and I, we, I do not recall running into any, you know, absolute failure to bring up Rook or bring up the cluster scenarios, um, you know, that you, you mentioned you had run into. So that may be yeah. something of interest um, as well. Okay. Yeah, I can put that in a, a list of things to, to consider. And I'd be interesting, interested to see, uh, you know, what failures you had already run into, um, because, you know, in general, having a multiple node uh, solution for developers and their workflow is pretty important to me. Um, so, you know, if you're having problems with that and that's, you know, kind of blocking things that you want to progress on, then, you know, I would like to be able to solve those or, you know, understand what those issues are. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. I might start trying to, to focus again on bringing up a, a virtualized uh, cluster. I mean, we have a, uh, a like Sousa has a, a the, our CASP product, which is like a, an operating system environment that already has Kubernetes up and running. Uh, I, I don't think that like there's anything particularly different about that that should be making the environment more difficult. Um, although I know uh, my like I'm I'm running against uh, a spinning disk that also has encryption on top, and so those could be part of my throughput issues. Yeah. Do you have an SSD and stuff like that? Is it powerful enough? The machine in general. Is there a development team working on storage anywhere that has a cluster as powerful as what they're trying to run on? <laughs> but yeah, it, it's, I, I guess it's good to know that having a multi-node development test environment is something that is, is deemed important. I've been uh, a little cautious to like jump totally on Minikube just because it seems like it's a somewhat of a degraded environment compared to what will exist in the real world. Yeah, and that's an absolutely valid point, Blaine. And, and you know, I've, I've seen Minikube as the, you know, the quickest possible way to, you know, have a Kubernetes cluster that I can test something on, um, you know, at the sacrifice of, uh, you know, more realistic real world scenarios. Um, but yeah, so losing, losing that um, ability to test in more realistic scenarios is, is definitely the drawback. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stupid things you can do that the mini cube will catch. <laughs> I'd say most of them. That's a good way to say, that's a good way to say that, Caitlin. <laughs> now, what about if we look into um, kind of together with the community and everyone uh, to see what would be a feasible solution to, um, yeah, kind of have an environment uh, that I push my pull request, Rook gets pulled, and the only thing I have to do is connect to, the, to some Kubernetes cluster, which maybe even started up with a pull request or something. Because at least in my case, my workstation is fast enough, so I don't have the pain. <laughs> so, hmm. um, but my internet is bad, so I can't just you know, put it uh, public and let you guys run your stuff on it. <laughs> So you're not going to host an environment for us, Alex? <laughs> I, I, I probably could on my bare metal class about it. Uh -huh. Cool. All right. Yeah. In, in general, if anyone you know has, uh, say, Blaine, you can feel free to share some of the issues that you're running into on a multi-node test environment. And then in general, anyone who has ideas about um, you know good ways to do uh, testing from you know in the development workflow on multiple nodes um, you know feel free to share those and add those and there's a bit of a discussion going pretty recent discussion ongoing on uh, ticket 1540 for that so I'll add that to the chat as well because uh, just as a last point here it depends on what you change turn off and what you want to test in the end because if I want to like do stuff at the Monco I'll most of the time start a simple Docker and Docker kube ADM cluster, which 
just uh, allows me to have multiple uh, nodes at least. If you have something bigger, I just start up more nodes with it. Uh, but for other smaller changes like simple stuff, mm -hmm. is the deem set updated uh, on changes or something? It is enough to well start a mini queue. Mm -hmm. So we have to really look into for the special cases kind of what we can do. So Alex, when you start that multiple node Docker and Docker, is that using some of the scripts in our repo or? No, it's uh, not. It's a complete yeah. separate uh, script. Yeah. So maybe even that would be a simple start to to help document or. Yeah, and it's script. pretty fast for, uh, from right. starting. Right. Yeah, you know, I was wondering if uh, if that works on the Mac at all. You know, because it uh, you know with the Docker on Mac uses like the you know the, their hyper kit that has some hypervisor functionality and I have no idea it doesn't really launch a full-fledged virtual machine so I don't know how it's like some kernel operations like that KRBD does would even be supported in an environment like that yeah. uh, do you have some time uh, this uh, this evening uh, this morning to look at it to just try it out on your Mac so maybe you can take a look if it works with, uh, with you uh, possibly uh, Probably sometime in the near future, but uh, not this morning because I've got some other, other things on the schedule this morning. But yeah, this is this is something we can continue making progress because this has been brought up so many times by so many people, and outside of even just Rook, and you know the you know the Minikube people and uh, project in general has you know stated that it's not never going to support. I don't think I think that they said they're not going to support multi-node. Um, so there's mm -hmm. kind of a lack in the community for this really. All right, uh, so I think that's about all we had to to talk today, and we're just about out of time. So I will go ahead and stop the recording now. Thanks, everyone. Yep, and thank you, everybody. For